You stand with us this morning. We are going to sing together. Can we put our hands together this morning? Come on, it's all right to move a little bit. Let's sing this together. I'll praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. Praise when I'm sure. And I'll praise when I'm down. Praise when I'm on who God is and based on what he's done in our lives. And 
I think that song is, is, is that to a T almost. Because it doesn't matter how bad life is right now, how rough things seem, how much the world wants to put us down. Because we got breath in our lungs this morning. And if we've got that, then we've got a reason to praise. Because God loves you, He cares for you. And there are things to hope for beyond what we can see right in front of us today, this morning. So as we continue to sing, I invite you to join us. Here we go.
Lord, we're thankful we can sing that in confidence. That you reign above every situation this morning. Let's sing this. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light.
You know, in the Bible, it tells us about a time where there's a multitude of people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every people group, and they're standing before the throne of God singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Angels and saints all surround the throne of God singing that song. And as you guys lifted up your voice, you joined in that heavenly chorus. How awesome is that, huh? So grateful for that. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that we could stand before your throne today, that you made access through the cross, that we could stand here and declare you are holy, you are good, you reign above it all, you're glorious, God. I pray, God, for my friends here today that they would know how loving, how awesome, how magnificent you are, God, that they would be totally encaptured and enraptured with your presence God, that their face would be on you, God, always. Their hearts would be yours. God, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, welcome to Salty. You can have a seat. Glad that you're here. My name is Jacob. If we haven't met before, I want to welcome our online crowd, too. Welcome from all over the world. Glad you're here with us. Hey, before we get started, I just want to recognize that right now is Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. And what the significance of that is, is that we remember our fallen heroes, those that gave their lives for our freedom. The very fact that we're sitting here or standing here worshiping God in a free country is because of men and women who sacrificed their lives. So we want to say thank you. Yes. We're grateful for that. Freedom is never free, and we know that. So as you're grilling out and barbecuing and doing whatever you do on Memorial Day, just remember that freedom was paid for you, okay? So uh, get, get started here with announcement time. What we have is every week we direct your attention to our digital connection card. It's on your screens here. This is a great way for you to take your next steps here at Salty. Connect here. Maybe you have a prayer request. We'd love to hear that. You could fill that out by scanning that QR code or you can go to salty.org, click on the Connect tab, let us know who you are. And by the way, if you're new or newer and you've never been back to our Welcome Start Here sign, we, we would encourage you to do that. You're our honored guest for being new or newer here, and uh, we have a little gift for you. But all these things, if you want to leave the work to us, you can always go back there and see the team back there. They love to help you get connected. 
and, um, and be a part of the mission here at Salty, okay? So one of the next steps that we have coming up is next Sunday, June 2nd, is Baptism Sunday here at Salty. It's a great time, yeah. And we love to celebrate life change in you. So if you've never been baptized or maybe you uh, were baptized as a child and you don't remember it and you want to redo that, that's great. This is a good first step, a next step of faith. Here's the thing about baptism. You don't have to have God figured out to get baptized, okay? You just have to know that Jesus is the way and that you're going to live for him. And this is going public with your faith by saying, hey, I want to be a part of what God is doing in this world, and I want to be his, and I want to declare it to everybody I'm his. So sign up today, scan the QR code, or go to salty.org, or our welcome start here sign to uh, um, get, be a part of the baptism, okay? Uh, next thing coming up, well, today is uh, the day before Memorial Day. Memorial Day is the gateway to summer. You guys ready for summer? How many parents are ready for summer? Yeah, exactly. So if you're a parent and you're freaking out, what do I do with my kids? We got a plan for you, okay? We got summer camps coming up. So we have surf camps for elementary and middle school kids. We have a middle school camp coming up. We also have a high school camp. So you want to scan that QR code, sign them up. You can go to the Welcome Start Here sign. Let them know that you want to be, you want your child to go to camp. Um, you could always go online to salty.org. Let us know that you want to be a part of that. And here's the thing. If any of the kids are in the room, which they probably shouldn't be, but if you're a student, high school, middle school student, and you went to camp, you know it's awesome time, right? And so uh, I saw one of our campers come in a little bit ago, and, uh, and we had a great time. A little bit crazy, but we have a good time, okay? So you want to be there, be a part of that, sign up today, all right? So one of the things that we do here every week, if you're new to Salty, we do this thing called connection time. And what, what that means is we put up a four-minute timer, and connection time is really designed for you to connect to one another, to connect to God. And here's some ways that you can do that. One is simply you can go grab some coffee, grab a donut, uh, maybe say hi to some people. And during that time, you can also spend some time in prayer right in your seat. We have crosses in the room where you can go to and pray um, silently by yourself. You can fill out that connection card and let us know that what your prayer request is. But here's the other thing. If you have a prayer need and you want somebody to pray with you, you can go right here. Underneath the exit sign is our prayer team. They'd love to pray with you. And uh, we believe in the power of prayer. And so you can do that during connection time. You can also receive communion. So we have communion stations around the room where you can just uh, take that uh, communion and remember what Jesus did for you on the cross. That's all communion is, is remembering what Jesus did for you on the cross and spending some time with him. And another great way to connect to God, connect to Salty Church, is through your giving, through your generosity. And you can do that through our kiosks, through our give boxes, or you can always go to salty.org, click on the give tab. Let us know you want to be part of the mission. And here's a verse for you. Proverbs um, says that uh, it's, it's better to have a little bit and be righteous than to have a lot and be dishonest. So what that means is it's not about having little or a lot. It's not about being dishonest or being godly, okay, because you can have a lot of money and be godly. You can have little money and be unrighteous, right? It's about character. And so when you practice generosity, what you're doing is you're developing your character. You're developing your faith in Jesus. You're saying the little bit I have, I'm giving to you. And I'm, I'm going to make a difference, but I'm going to build that character. I'm going to become more like Jesus. That's what our whole series has been about is following Jesus, practicing the way and becoming like him. And so in your generosity, you become like him. Because we believe generosity changes everything. And that's one of our foundation um, values here. And so as you give, thank you. Thank you for making a difference. You're making a difference in so many lives here uh, in this area and around the world. So we're going to go into our connection time. After we come back, we're going to hear from Robbie a great message. So let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for how good you are, how loving you are. Thank you for our time to connect to one another, connect to you, God. Would you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. See you back in four minutes. Two thousand years ago, Jesus invited his first disciples with a simple call. Come, follow me. But what does it mean to follow Jesus today in our busy, digitally distracted, and increasingly secular culture? 
Throughout history, countless lives have been transformed by accepting his call. Their response changed not only their lives, but the course of human history. And it can do the same for you. Yeah, good, good morning, Salty Church. Yeah, here we go as we uh, transition and uh, excited to have you here as we are, are talking about practicing the way. The uh, series that we're doing is uh, based on a book by John Mark Homer, and it uh, gives us a bit of an outline to talk through over these next uh, several weeks. And um, speaking of walking on the beach, uh, something I want to tell you about real quick before we get into the subject, and that is if you like walking on the beach and uh, uh, following Jesus at the same time, we got a mission trip coming up uh, in August. There are a few spots left uh, to go to Costa Rica, which is... Um, walking on a beach, following Jesus, and doing some cool stuff. If you are interested, mid-August, Costa Rica, uh, Blake, one of our campus pastors, in partnership with Christian Surfers International, we're doing a trip. If you're interested, find uh, talk to somebody at one of the um, welcome desks or fill out a connection card, and uh, we'll get you connected. So I want to make sure you know about that. So with that said, uh, practicing the way is discipleship. It's apprenticeship. It's how to follow Jesus in this everyday world that we're in. And so throughout the whole series, our outline is this. You know, to, as an apprentice of Jesus, we want to be with, to become, and to do. Right? So very simple, pretty easy to understand uh, what that's like. It's a whole other game, though, to actually do these things. It's not easy. And so each week we'll be wrestling with some of that. The first couple, of, well, I would say this, too. Um, each week builds on another. So we're doing two, four, six weeks all in this. Each builds on top of another. No, it's... Two here, two there, three there. Each builds on the other. So for the first two weeks, it was be with Jesus. And uh, last week, I left you with two words to remember. If you were here last week, do you remember the two words? Excellent. You did better than me. Um, <clears throat> Because come to find out, uh, it's, it's just not easy, of course. To, we talked about this last week, you know, practicing the presence of, uh, to be with this Holy Spirit mindfulness. You know, because Jesus isn't hanging around with us, so it's hard to actually be with him. But Jesus, Holy Spirit, they're the same guy. Holy Spirit's within us. And so that mindfulness, Holy Spirit, when I'm going through something, feeling something, blood pressure's rising, it's like mindfulness. All right, Holy Spirit, you're here, you're with me, you'll help me. And so that, you know, it takes practice. I want to encourage you to continue to practice that because the reality is it's human nature. Um, This uh, Paris, this guy, Paris Reed, had said most Christians don't have fellowship with God. They have fellowship with each other about God. So a lot of times we have an identity. Oh, I'm a Christian. That's a part of our identity. So that means you hang out with other Christians or you believe like other Christians Great, that's a good start, but are you, you know, are you practicing the presence of God to be with him? So Holy Spirit is the way by which we do that. And so if you missed this last week or any of the past ones, go online. You can watch any of these messages and catch up. But for this week, we start uh, this week and next week on this becoming element. And that become is uh, a result of being. So the more you are with God, as more as you practice the presence of God in very easy, practical ways, then the more then you become like, so there's an internal shift that'll happen, a change that happens in you. And so we're going to be talking about that for two weeks, starting today, that idea of, of becoming. And it's um, such a foundational, fundamental, basic kind of a thing. But again, uh, it's important that we um, think about these things regularly. And so uh, as we get started in this, I wanted to start in a really unusual way, think about the becoming. I want to set the stage with a bit of a theme, and um, the theme, well, not a theme, but just uh, an illustration, I guess, and it would be um, this. I made one of these things. Anybody ever seen, uh, like on TV, one of these? Here, let me just give you a, a visual there, and there we go. Yeah. So we call it a dunce cap. So yeah, for those of you who have never seen this, believe it or not, um, It was not uncommon up into the 50s that in a classroom, a teacher would pick on a kid that was maybe misbehaving or not doing well or whatever, and as a behavior modification tool, make him sit in the corner of the room wearing this dunce cap. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, 
short-term effective maybe, but there's some problems with that, okay? Uh, and, and unfortunately, it was done uh, for a long time up until at least the 50s when we began to realize that shame is a, you know, not a good long-term behavior modification tool, okay? But here's what's interesting about this. I found out is the, um, is the, uh, the, the origin of that, where did all that get started? To me, it was the more interesting part of it. So let me just tell you about the origin of a dunce cap. Really interesting. Uh, there was a guy, his name was John Duns, D-U-N-S, Scotus. And I uh, was from Scotland, in a, from a town called Duns, D-U-N-S. His name is John. And so uh, back in the 1200s, this guy was a, a pretty renowned uh, thinker and a philosopher, a theologian, and all of that, a priest even, uh, taught in the University of Paris in the 1200s, so way back, right? thousand years ago. Um, interesting about it is, um, even since then, Duns, the Scots, so he's Scottish, he was from this town, his name is John. Uh, his argument for the existence of God is rightly regarded as one of the most outstanding contributions ever made to natural theology. So, Smart guy, right? Really smart. Now, the thing, the thing about it, though, is it seems a little strange to me. He was fairly well known also for his hats. And so he would make different kinds of hats or whatever. And people who were like, you know, um, in his circle might be wearing these funny hats of some sort. It was part of his style, part of his old little stick and thing that he did. But nonetheless, he was a really, really smart guy. The problem was, is uh, as the Renaissance came around, up in like the 1500s, and the Renaissance was all about uh, humanistic thinking and really could care less about the existence of God, they began to put down his teachings and began to look negatively about the, um, the things that he would say in, in a lot of different ways. And so, uh, you know, to be a part of uh, a follower of Dunn's was a pejorative, and they started using that as a negative. And it started off as dunceman, and then eventually it was dunce. And so we would pronounce it D-U-N-C-E, dunce. And so from the 1500s to the 1950s, they used it as a tool uh, for shaming and behavior modification because it was such a bad thing. So it's like, I think, an actual photo of a classroom where this teacher is kind of like lecturing, and you got the one And I don't know why, but every picture ever made of a, somebody wearing a dunce cap, it's a boy. <laughs> I think. Um, there's no comment about all that, but it, interesting. And so, so the, this idea of, um, of, you know, to shame somebody, that is an effective tool for short-term behavior modification, right? You don't want to be in that chair and people making fun of you, so you're going to behave while you're in class. But shame, though, is a really poor a shaper of a healthy heart. To be shamed, you know, can be scarring, right? In fact, um, yeah, I was thinking about that. Anybody ever uh, have that experience in school? Okay, all, yeah, maybe, but here's what's more important. As you even look at this picture, um, to what extent folks sometimes have a view of God like this? You know, he's like this mean school teacher who you better get it right. And if not, you're going to be shamed into, you know, behaving properly. You know, I was thinking about like this picture here on the, on the drawing board. I don't know if you can read it. It says, I will be good. I will be good. I will be good. And he had to write it 50 times on the chalkboard. Even when I was in school, we used to have to write sentences like, I will not lie to my teacher ever again. Like a hundred times is like a punishment, right? But how many times do we, do we sometimes feel like maybe God sees us this way? Like when you're bad, you are shamed into changing your behavior and you got to promise to be good, be good, you know. And how often do we, do, do we think about God that way? How, how many of you may um, um, have one of these? Hey, not, not like an actual thing you put on your head, but, but maybe we, we wear one on our heart. Like a, not, not to be ashamed, but carrying shame. That's interesting. Sit with that. Think about that as I want to tell you a, a, a story. This is a story from uh, Luke, uh, Luke 18. 
And in this story, uh, Jesus, uh, um, he, when he makes up stories, they're just amazing because they're so masterful in how he says so much with little words and really brings out some thinking. So in Luke uh, 18 is really a base story for what we're going to be looking at today in terms of becoming uh, like Jesus and to act like and to think like Jesus. This tells us a little bit and might challenge your thinking on some things. So Luke 18 uh, is where we're going to sit. So here we go. Luke 18, starting verse 9. Now remember, this is a made-up story. It's a parable. Um, so the details he adds, it's not a true story. It's an illustration, right? And who is he telling this story to? He's aiming this story at some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. So people are kind of like thinking they're better than everybody else and are happy to point a finger at those who don't measure up, who would probably go around shaming people quite a bit. So in order, you know, as, as Jesus is telling a story, he's aiming this story at them. Okay, so it's, it's probably not you, it, but it's somebody else, okay? So Pharisees, really. So he tells the story, and he goes like this. He says, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a despised tax collector. So we get two different kinds of people. And uh, many of you already have an understanding of this, but just for a few who maybe who don't, a Pharisee is a, a, a religious scholar, a, um, a very, has a very legal, legalistic mindset about religion and faith, uh, but also because of Jewish culture, uh, would have a lot of social credibility and also a lot of uh, social influence. So they're like, they're like the big men in town who, you know, they could sway things one way or another culturally. They were well known, but also super religious. Um, when it comes to getting it right and doing all of the things that God's law required, that was their specialty, very legalistic in mindset. And then we got a tax collector. And he's not just a tax collector, he's a despised tax collector. Many of you have an understanding of that, but, but consider it's like, it's not just like IRS agent, it's not, not that. You know, I was thinking about like um, being Memorial Day, I was thinking like uh, Boston Tea Party. You know, we had, uh, uh, England had a territory, a colony with the Americas, and then they would, they would tax the Americans and bring all that American money over to England to fund the crown, right? And so taxation without representation, whatever. Um, imagine a, a, an American born in America, living in Boston, and your job is to collect and send money back to England. It's like you're a, you're a traitor. It's like, it's like calling the police on your neighbors because they're not paying their taxes. Your neighbors aren't going to like you very much, right? So all of that's going into this story a little bit. So this guy is not just somebody you don't like, but, but man, you're you're happy to hate that guy, okay? So big contrast between the two people. Each of them go to the temple to pray. So in this story, Jesus makes up the story. Um, it, it goes like this. The Pharisee stands by himself and prays. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. And that's his prayer. Interesting. On the other hand, uh, we have the, the tax collector who stands at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven and he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. It's a big contrast, right? And that's essentially the whole story there. As Jesus outlines, he draws out this imagery for people to consider. And it probably wouldn't be all that much of an exaggeration of what really could happen. But what's interesting about it, story is I, I was thinking about it this way, um, it just masterful storytelling because, here's the thing, uh, when you look at a story, where would you see yourself in this story? And it's a bit of a tricky question, I think. Where do you see yourself in this story? So, for instance, you know, Pharisee. Now, depending on how you think about Pharisees, but, 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 but here's the catch, though, on this. What does the Pharisee think about himself? The Pharisee is somebody who's a faithful worshiper who's doing his best to honor God with who he is and what he has. And, it, yeah, let's just sit with that. Uh, who do you see yourself in a story? And, and robbers, adulterers, uh, evildoers. Those are, those are folks who, um, you know, the sinners, the people who 
did some things, and because of what they did, now they have an identity that they carry with them. And that identity is typically given to them by somebody else, and there could be a long list of what those are. So, you know, if you um, rob somebody one time, you're a robber for the rest of your life, okay? And, and, and generally, I'm thinking like, uh, you know, you, you got a gun, and it's, this is a stick-up kind of thing. Or what, what about somebody who just stole something here and there and got caught and now because of the shame put on them now have a, you know, uh, um, the identity of being a thief? Sometimes because of the things that we've done or a um, mistake we've made, we've been given an identity somewhere and we, you really sometimes can't seem to escape it. And then you got the, the tax collector who, um, you know, wealthy, probably the richest guy in town, or at least in the neighborhood for sure, you know? And so people, you know, social outcasts, not accepted by everybody because of your job. Uh, but your job is, pays well, so you're doing well. Where, where do you see yourself in a story? You know, are you, are you the, uh, maybe the, those who were without any hope in this or somebody who sees himself as a faithful worshiper? So it's a little tricky, isn't it? So where do you actually see yourself? And, and of course, what, what, what we want to do is we want to see ourselves as, as uh, you know, the, 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 the person on the right side of, of, of how to think about things in terms of how God thinks. But it, to me, it's interesting to, to consider because maybe the, maybe the reality is we ought to see ourselves in all three characters. Maybe. You know, we, we want to be faithful worshipers doing good things so that, that, you know, we're honoring God with what we do. Now, we don't want to do it with a bad attitude, clearly. Uh, we would all be happy to be super rich in our jobs. That's good. <laughs> but also, we don't want to be despised by, by neighbors and, and by the people around us. So it, it's, it's tricky. Now, the reality is, as, as one prays with one attitude and another prays with a different attitude, you can guess the outcome of the story, probably. So Jesus, in verse 14, says, here, I'll tell you this, the sinner, the tax collector, not the Pharisee, return, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I underline that word justified. You remember the word means, right? Justified. It's just as if I'd not sinned. So one, both of them go to church. Both of them pray. One of them goes home holy, and the other one does not. And, and, and it, you know, and when Jesus is telling a story in, in his day, it would have been shocking for them to consider that a tax collector, the despised person that he is, could go home holy in God's eyes. But Jesus uses this example here, this story to teach the lesson. And the lesson really is uh, humility is critical. The humility is what um, makes maybe all the difference in God's eyes. So that, that, that idea of humility, and, and um, I mean, it's, it's a tricky thing because um, humility is different than being humiliated. Ashamed is different than carrying shame. So it's tricky to think about, you know, for us as a people, how to live and how to operate because we see ourselves, we want to see ourselves being on the right side of, of how God thinks about us. We want to be, we want God to, to recognize us and to love us for what we do, and so it's it's difficult. We want to be worshipers, and we want to be humble, and, but, but how do we really sit through that? And, and the difficulty, too, is that we're living in a world that um, understands the word sin completely in subjective ways. You know, tax collectors are despised sinner. You got these uh, evildoers and others that are these sinners, right? And the Pharisee didn't see himself as a sinner. What is a sinner? Because plenty of times, especially in modern culture, sin is just means uh, any, you know, the, the sinner is the person who is not able to be true to themselves. So you can, define, you can define good living however you want to. And so, you know, if you're not true to yourself or, or you know, if you're going <coughs> to, if you're going to, uh, you know, be insulting to other people or if you're going to be offensive to other people, that's the greatest sin probably. And so sin now means all a million different things. Do we even have understanding of that, right? So I was wrestling with that, thinking about it in terms of this, uh, constantly going back to this scripture as I did last week, in terms of being with God and, and, and having the Holy Spirit within us. But the, the fruit of the, like how do you know that Holy Spirit is within you is these nine characteristics. 
You know, living by the Spirit, so it's being with God via Holy Spirit. If you do that, you're going to have more of these nine things. And so I, I really look at these nine things as characteristics by which um, is, is really holiness. And so you, you want to be more like God. You want to, therefore, if you want to become more like Jesus, we've got to be with the Holy Spirit. These things are evident in our life. <clears throat> and I say this because... This really helps me to also understand what is really, how to evaluate sinfulness. To what extent are you a sinner? So I started, so just thinking about it this way, take, take what is holy and invert it to the negative. And so it would be more like, you know, miserable, hateful, anxious, impatient, meanness, immoral, distrusting, aggressive, unruly, like the, like the, op, the antonyms to all of those uh, Holy Spirit words. So then I start wrestling with it. You know, do I have any of these things evident in my life throughout the week? You know, at, at times, you know, just as long as you leave out impatience, I'm doing okay, right? Um, you know, distrust or, you know, anxious, unruly, you know, aggressive applies to all kinds of things, including driving and other stuff. And, um, you know, how we treat people. How are we doing? You know, um, to what extent we see ourselves as sinners or holy. Depends on how you define it all. And then, and then if, if you don't recognize your holiness or sinfulness in your life, to what extent that's a big problem, right? So in fact, uh, G, uh, um, later on in uh, one of the uh, New Testament scriptures in 1 John 1 says this, if we say we have no sins, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. That, that, that matches up pretty well with that early scripture, doesn't it? Where the Pharisees, like, you know, real interesting in his prayer. If you consider his prayer, like, God, God, I'm super happy. You know, I thank you that I'm not like them. So it's like, do you see the pride that's all in his voice, right? You know, I'm not like his tax. I, you know, look what I do. And, he, and like, his prayer is, see God, see what I do? See how good I am? Man, we ought, like we ought to be happy when we grow more like Jesus. We ought to be happy when we are, you know, if you're, if you're generous with your income, you should be happy that you're growing in maturity, right? Uh, you know, if you're fasting once in a while, right? You're, you're, you're practicing the presence. That's a good, those are good things. But, but to have pride in those things. You know, so, so to what extent we, we, when we think about ourselves, we see the scripture. If, if I say that I don't have any sin, and a lot of times what it is, like, what we'll do is we'll say, um, I know I'm not perfect, but, right? So I, I, I know I, I'm not without sin, but God, you know I do a bunch of good things, right? So we're not like a major Pharisee in the story, but maybe we're little Pharisees. It's like, you know, I'm not perfect, but, you know, I'm pretty good. I've got a couple, like the fasting thing or, or prayer thing or I go into church stuff. Like, like, I'm pretty, I'm not terrible, but I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, if we say we don't have sin, and I don't know that anybody does that, but we, we hedge a little bit. Or do we recognize our sinfulness? You consider the prayer of the, the tax collector. He doesn't even look up to heaven. You know, in sorrow, he's crying out. And that's where First John, I, I love this scripture so much. It says that if, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from huge, massive, three-letter word right there. You see it? All unrighteousness. Justified, just as if I'd not sinned. Righteous, justified, holy, all of the same words there. If we confess our sin, he will. So it is major promise right here in this scripture. Huge promise. He is faithful and just and will forgive and cleanse from all. The question is, is who do we pray like? God, I know I'm not perfect, but you know, I, you know, you recognize how I'm getting it okay sometimes, right? Or, man, I'm, I'm a work in progress, right? And, and God, I failed, and here's how I failed, and, and God, I need you to heal me and forgive me. He is faithful and just and will 
forgive them all. Now, I, I love the positive side of that, and I, I, I'm tempted to even skip out on the negative side of it, but nonetheless, you know, the scripture says, and, but if we say we haven't sinned, we make God out to be a liar. It's pretty hard, isn't it? And his word is not in us. If we say we, like, if we are not recognizing our sin, then God, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as most people. And I don't know if we ever really actually say it, but sometimes, sometimes we're there. You know, the flip side of that, of course, is for those who are, you know, the evildoers who, who carry around their shame with them all of the time, and that, and that, my, that my sin is so bad that I'm so broken that there's no way God could ever forgive me, which carries just as much pride. Like, I'm so bad. Look how bad I am, God. You can't do anything about that. It's pride. But if we confess, he will forgive all. He not only will, but he can. He is eager to. In fact, he wants to. I would love the fact that, that in this story, as Jesus tells the story about the, the, the Pharisee and the tax collector, you never see Jesus pointing a finger and condemning those who are humble and low. In fact, the only time Jesus has any harsh words for anybody all throughout the whole scriptures are the Pharisees. It's the high and mighty, the people who got it all together and who don't have any problems, and the arrogant, right? That's who Jesus points a finger at. But you never see Jesus using shame as a tool to, 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 to shape people for behavior modification. In fact, consider the opposite of the word. Do you know what the opposite of the word shame is? This is fascinating and um, and thank you again to my um, wife, Chrissy, who's just teaching me these things. It's so good. The opposite of, of shame is delight. The opposite of shame is delight. And so many of us, sometimes, we, it, it, if we're not ignoring our sin, it's we, we're, we're, our sin becomes our identity. And the thing that, that I want you to know today, and here's the big, the big bottom line for all of this, is, is God is not looking to shame you. He wants to take delight in you. In fact, Zephaniah 3, the Lord your God is with you. Holy Spirit presence. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you. And he does this when we are to, like that tax collector, humble and, and low and God, without you, I'm doomed. And, he, and, and what he says is he elevates those who are humble. And for us to be in that place is critical. So as we think about this whole um, series and where we're at with this, you know, the idea of to uh, become like Jesus, to become like him, it's foundational, it's fundamental, uh, uh, is, is to be with him. And that shaping of who we are and who we are becoming requires our humility, and with that, God can do anything. Without your humility, you're stuck. And so today, I just want to leave you with that understanding because we're going to just build on this as we go. What does it mean to practice the way to follow Jesus? It's uh, becoming like him as we practice his presence. So let me leave you with something to think about here. And I really wrestled with this thought and this question today. Um, I hope it'll, it'll come across the way I intend Here's the question, like in um, the, our text today, you know, will you go home justified? In the, in the made-up story Jesus had, they both went to church and they both prayed. One went home justified, holy, righteous. And, and, and Jesus' invitation is for all of us to go home today justified. He wants that. He wants to take delight in you. And there's one thing he asks not that you get it right, but you have a humble heart. So trust that he is faithful and just, and he will answer your prayer. So let's take a moment before you go and give you an opportunity. And uh, the prayers aren't complicated. There, there's no model prayers that we have to pray about anything. But, saying, but with your heart, speak to him. 
and understand that 1 John 1, 9 says that he is faithful and just and will. He will. It's a promise. It's guaranteed that there's no going home shame-filled anymore. So in our reflection time on all of our campuses, we have an opportunity just to take a moment before we go to maybe put one of these things into practice and um, maybe the prayer. So take a moment, pray, and then here in a few minutes, we'll, we'll come back and we'll close up, okay?